Time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Dollar, thank goodness I found you. Why, what's up? You've got to leave for New York, Dollar, immediately. A policyholder, he's afraid for his life. Here we go again. Who's he afraid of? Well, he wouldn't say over the telephone. All I know is, to us, he's worth $100,000, alive. Well, that makes it simple. He must be afraid of somebody to whom he's worth $100,000 dead. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Continental Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures fulfilling your assignment as a, well, as a bodyguard. The body being that of your late policyholder, Robert W. Perry. Expense account, item one, fare on night train, Hartford to New York, 365. Expense account item two, a dollar eighty taxi to Lower Manhattan following morning to officers Perry and Van Bruten, importers, arriving as promised at exactly 9 a.m. Oh, good morning. May I help you? Yes, you certainly can. My name is Johnny Dollar. I have an appointment with Mr. Perry for 9 o'clock. Oh, yes, from the insurance company. <laughs> well, you're right on time. Yes, they told me I'd better be, and I'm glad that I am. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Perry just came in. He's alone and waiting for you. I'll buzz him that you're here. Thanks. Oh, oh, God. God. What was left of your policyholder, Mr. Perry, was just sliding out of a swivel chair as I hit the room. The top of his desk had erupted and splinters of mahogany pointed their sharp fingers upward through lazy circles of smoke swirling toward the ceiling. The buzzer from his secretary's desk had been rigged to a booby trap. Oh, no. Oh, no. Mr. Perry. Stay away from him. Come on, there's nothing you can do. He's dead. Oh. What happened? What happened? Whatever happened? Let's go. Let's get back out of here. Here you are. Sit down. I'll get you a drink of water. Come on, drink this. There's a doctor on the third floor. Shall I call him? Never mind the doctor. Go call the police. Nobody gets in here till they arrive. Now, the rest of you, go on, run along, beat it, will you? And have the building superintendent turn off that alarm. Okay, miss, now take it easy. It was all so sudden. What happened? Well, that's not hard to figure out. Somebody wanted to give your boss, Mr. Perry, a shortcut through life. So whoever it was figured out that a secretary would never buzz a boss unless he was at his desk. He rigged up a bomb somewhere in his desk that would go off when you buzzed him. Oh, then, then, then I killed him. No, no, I... wait a minute, will you? Wait a minute. Don't go hysterical on me. There's excitement enough and there'll be more when the police get here, so you keep cool. But I did it. You saw me do it. Look, honey, the way you put it, I killed him by coming in here and giving you my name so you would buzz him. And I was here to protect him. So drop it, will you? I, I, I'm sorry. Now tell me, what about yesterday? Was Perry here? Yes, all day. What time was it when you last used the buzzer? Oh, I, right up to the last minute, about 5.30. Who left the office first? Oh, Mr. Perry, he always leaves first. I lock up. From the looks of things, you should have used more locks last night. Somebody got in here to do some wiring. Oh, I forgot that fire alarm. Look, before the police arrived, do you know why I was sent here? Oh, yes. M Mr. Perry felt that his life was in danger. He thought that, well, with a $100,000 policy, the insurance company would do everything they could to help keep him alive. Oh, well, he didn't have much of a chance, did we? What was he afraid of? I don't know. Okay. Tell me, what were his other appointments for today? Well, he, he only had two. 
His partner, Mr. Van Bruten, at 11, and later he No, had one a... at a time, please. Van Bruten. Anything special about their meeting? Oh, yes, Mr. Van Bruten arrived just yesterday from Holland. Oh, you mean there was a branch of this firm in Holland, Oh, huh? yes. Uh, Mr. Perry was buying out Van Bruten's interest. They had their final meeting at Van Bruten's hotel last night. I see. Van Bruten was coming by this morning to, to pick up his money. Cash? No, a, a cashier's check. The bank is to deliver it here at 10.30. Well, Perry's other appointment, who is that? Christine, his wife. Now, now she tells me. Christine, the beneficiary. Yes. She wouldn't have been the beneficiary in about another two weeks. They were getting a divorce. Thanks for the motive. You don't like her. Well, I, I, I didn't mean it that way. Well, how about Perry? Did you like him? Okay, here's an easier one. What's your name? Susan. Susan Gates. Now, isn't that about enough? Okay, Susan, you better save your voice. During the next few hours, you're going to have to do a lot of talking. I've been everywhere else. Is the fire in here? Well, you'll have to stick around. When the cops get here, somebody will get burned. The firemen should have stuck around because the cops arrived in a blaze of glory. It was a very high-class investigation, two lieutenants. Finally, after about an hour, the police photographer ran out of flash bulbs, the office of the deceased ran out of fingerprints, and the lieutenants ran out of questions. So the on-the-scene phase of the investigation was closed. At about five minutes of 11, I left the police packing up their notebooks, their clues, and the body, and went into the outer office. Susan looked like she could use a big, broad shoulder to weep on, but unfortunately, I was wearing my light gray suit. About then, a dark blue suit and a deep green voice entered the room from the corridor. There, there. There's a fellow out here says he belongs here. His name is Van Bruten. Well, what do you think? His name is on the door you just opened. Oh. Well, now, my name happens to be Murphy, and it's on beds all over the country. But that don't mean I'm stuffed with feathers, does it? Well, never cross tongues with an Irishman. All right, send him in, officer. Uh, all right, you can go in. There's a policeman out there. There's trouble here. Uh, I am Brian Van Bruden. There is Mr. Perry. What? He is waiting for me, no? No. But my appointment... He's not keeping any. He's dead. Dead? Oh, this is not possible. Last night I saw him. He was well. What happened? He was hit by a buzz bomb. A buzz bomb? Oh, please. You, you mean... That there was foul play? Yes, yes, it was very foul. Oh, please. I may sit down. My first visit in all these years since before the war. It was to be so happy. But now tragedy like this. He was a good man, a, a good partner. I understand that as of last night, you were no longer partners. Yeah, yeah. I am glad you mentioned that. I realize, of course, that... It is indelicate to speak of such things as money at a time like this, but uh, that is why I am here, uh, to receive my payment. Just because Perry got his, there's no reason for you not getting yours, huh? Oh, but you, you misunderstand me. I, I am deeply grieved, but, well, since the transaction was consummated, uh, what is there to do? A, a delay would be a needless waste of money. I have already paid for passage back to Antwerp tomorrow. Uh, your, your check is here, Mr. Van Bruten. Oh. Here you are. God, uh, uh, thank you. In all of my years of business, this is indeed the saddest moment. Yeah. Well, if I didn't have some work to do, I'd sit down with you, and we'd all have a good cry. Expense account item three, 90 cents, phone call to the home office. Mr. Gordon's office. Look, honey, this is Johnny Dollar. I want to speak to Mr. Gordon. Uh, while I'm telling him what I've got to tell him, uh, maybe you'd better sit there in his lap with some smelling salts. I'm not that type of a secretary. Besides, 
Besides, he doesn't have a lamp. <laughs> Hello, Dollar. How are you making out? Out? About $100,000. Uh, what's that? Yeah. You know, you should have sent me earlier. Somebody turned Mr. Perry into a firecracker just after I got here. He's dead. Oh. Oh, oh, that's bad news. Big policy. Yeah, what I want to know is, shall I stay on the case? Well, certainly, Dollar, by all means. Oh, um, is there a chance of uh, proving suicide? Uh, there's a non-payment clause. Yeah, to make this one a suicide, there'd have to be a Santa Claus. Nobody could hate himself enough to do it this way. Uh, well, uh, what are the fraud possibilities? Fair, there's an estranged wife. She's the beneficiary, but she wouldn't have been in a couple of weeks. Divorce coming up. I'll start with her. All right, Dollar. Good luck. Uh, but watch those expenses. Why, Gordon, I'm surprised. I think an insurance man would be the first to want to see a fellow live a little. <laughs> Christine Perry's apartment was on Sutton Place overlooking the East River. I took the elevator up to the 24th floor, and there I discovered that our garden-fresh widow was living high in more ways than one. Everything about the place was French. The maid who led me into the living room through a long foyer, the decor, and the perfume which reminded you that breathing can be fun. I looked up from enjoying my nose to see Mrs. Perry looking down hers. Mr. Dollar? Mrs. Perry. I believe we can dispense with the social amenities. You're an insurance investigator, interested in the death of my husband. So naturally, you're here because you've jumped to the conclusion that I killed him. Uh, you're the one that's jumping to conclusions, lady. And careful you don't break your leg. What do you want? The policy's in order. Premiums are fully paid. You know, I'm not quite sure what I want. I know that you've got a great motive. So far, the only motive I've found. You haven't had much time to look, have you? Check. This is my first stop. Maybe you can help me. Do you know anyone who would be happier with your husband out of the way? I know very little about my husband's friends. For that matter, his activities for the past six months. That's when I left him. Well, that's not much help for either of us. You know, without someone else to suspect, I may just have to concentrate on you. Mr. Dollar. I pick the men I want to concentrate on me. I hope you're as long on alibis as you are short on temper. Where were you last night? With a friend, Al Donovan. For a while, the same place my husband was. But I have witnesses to prove who was with him. Anybody at the Clover Club can tell you. Save me a trip. I can't afford the prices they get over there. Certainly. A pleasure. My husband was with his beautiful little secretary. Susan Gates. Well, I wouldn't be more surprised if your late husband walked through that door and said... All right, mister, that's enough. How? Yeah. How much did you hear? I'm a big guy, baby, six foot four. I've got big ears to match. Al, please. Would this be Mr. Donovan, your companion of last evening? I'm getting you out of here, Christine. Al, you don't know what you're saying. You lie to me. How can I help you if you lie to me? You call me stupid. The way you're playing this, you'll alibi yourself right into a cell. I'm getting you out of here. What are you doing to me, Al? You crazy. Come on. She's right. You are stupid, Donovan. She was doing just fine till you dropped in. Mister, you've been asking a lot of questions. Now I'm going to give you one answer. <coughs> All right, Christine. So much for the wise guy. Now about you and your alibi. You wasn't with me at the Clover Club last night. And if it's so easy to prove that your husband was there with his secretary, who were you there with? Remember, baby, you told me you were going to be with your husband. When Al measured me for that swing, I measured my chances with him. To me, he looked like one of those corporate assets of Murder Incorporated. So I rolled with the punch and kept my eyes closed and ears open. What I heard was Christine's alibi flying out the window, Mr. Donovan giving her a few loving cuffs, and finally, the pair of them flying out the door. Just then, the noon whistle blew somewhere in New York, and I decided to allow myself the luxury of one full minute for lunch. <laughs>
return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... And now we return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Edmund O'Brien. I spent the minute I took out for lunch eating a handful of Mrs. Perry's bonbons on the run. I hit the street just in time to see Donovan pushing Christine Perry into a cream-colored convertible. When they got rolling, I piled into an even yellower vehicle with a meter on it and started off cross town playing tag through traffic. At 57th and Broadway, things got complicated. My cab was three cars behind them when a red light flashed them to a stop. Then the door of their car flew open, Christine dashed out across the street and melted into the river of humanity flowing down into the subway. Since Al Donovan didn't follow her, I followed him. When he finally pulled to a stop, he took two chances. He parked in a no parking zone and walked straight into the building beside it, a police station. This is Mr. Dollar, Lieutenant. He's been waiting for you. Well? My name is Johnny Dollar, Lieutenant. Here are my credentials. Uh, the insurance, huh? Yeah, yeah, the Perry murder in particular. You've come to the right place, Dollar. A man named Donovan just walked in here and made a full confession. He what? That's right. My clerk's just typing it up. In the meantime, the gentleman is down in the tank having a bite of lunch on the city. He confessed. Well, does his story add up? As far as I know, I haven't heard too much about the case myself. Not in my precinct. Yeah, but what did he use for a motive? Jealousy. Says he's in love, wanted to marry Perry's wife. Did he say how he managed it? Yeah, he stole a key to the office from the wife's apartment. Entered the building last night and wired the bomb to the buzzer system. Well, I guess guys do a lot of strange things in the name of love. It looks like Donovan did. Yeah, he either killed the man or he's trying to cover up for someone who did. Say, Lieutenant, don't execute him for a couple of days, will you? I spent the rest of the afternoon downtown in the offices of Perry and Van Bruten, importers. The partner's correspondents told me two things. They had been extremely friendly, and Van Bruten was extremely bald. Perry had been sending him two pays from a famous Hollywood makeup firm. At 4.30, I got to the employment files which rocked me with two minor explosions of their own. First, I learned that Al Donovan had been employed over a period of years as Perry's bodyguard, and that he had been canned the day before the murder. That confession of his, which had been a little hard to swallow, was suddenly more digestible. On top of this came blast number two, the employment application of Perry's secretary, Miss Susan Gates, informed me that during the war, she had worked in a munitions plant. Her specialty, wiring bomb fuses. When the Susan Gates reached home at 8.30, she found a visitor, me. Oh. How did you get in here? Professional secret. Oh, you scared me. What do you want? Why did you come here this way? I wanted to bring you the good news. I heard on the radio that Al Donovan confessed to Perry's murder. Al? I, I can't believe it. Why not? Who do you like for the spot? Why, Christine. Al is covering up for her. Well, I'd like to agree with you. If it turns out that Christine wound up her husband's life with a bang, the company that hired me saves $100,000. But I don't know. She claims she has all kinds of alibis. One of them is you. Me? Yeah. Did you see her at the Clover Club last night? Oh, yeah. Well, yes, I... Uh... Yeah, I know who you were with, your boss. There's nothing wrong with that. No, 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 I'm not preaching a sermon. I, I want to know who she was with. I don't know. A man I'd never seen before. Mr. Perry knew him, but he wouldn't tell me who he was. Why not? I don't know. He said I might get the wrong idea. About what? I don't know. We didn't sit there and talk about it all night, so why should we sit here and talk about it all night? All right, all right. Good heavens, when a census taker shows up and asks a lot of questions, people answer them. When an investigator tries to do his job, they, they make the proverbial clam look like a, a blabbermouth. Look, 
Look, Mr. Dollar, believe me. This has been a greater shock to me than to anyone else. Yes, excepting, of course, your late employer, Mr. Perry. How long did you work for him? Four years. Where'd you work before then? Well, I worked... Let me help you. Bombs, huh? Wiring fuses. Remember? All right. I remember. Good. Maybe you'll remember a little more. Let's go back to last night. The guy with Christine Perry, who was he? I tell you, I don't know. Was it Van Bruton? I don't know. You don't know? No. I'll get that. No, no, I'll go. Just make sure you don't keep going. Susan! When Susan snapped the spring lock to open the door, the gun outside opened up. The first slug caught her in the left shoulder, spinning her out of the way of the rest of them. It was getting monotonous. Every time a buzzer went off, things started booming. Susan was sprawled out on the floor in front of the door, and to open it, I had a mover. By the time I did, the hallway outside was empty. Okay, okay, now, take it easy. Come on. Won't start hurting for a couple of minutes. We'll have a doctor here by then. He'll give you something. Please, please, try to keep calm. Here, boy. I'll throw my coat over here. Now, try not to move. You're going to ruin this rug. Never mind the rug. What we want to worry about is who tried to ruin you. What will they do to me? What will who do to you? They'll arrest me. They don't arrest people for getting shot. You have any idea who it was? That man in the office this morning. The one who picked up the check. Van Bruton? No. No, he wasn't Van Bruton. He was a phony? Yeah. And you still gave him that check? Yes. Well, I won't ask you why. You gave him that check and then tried to blackmail him. Is that right? They'll arrest me. I wouldn't be surprised. Who is this guy? Where can I find him? Come on, don't pass out on me now. His name, quick, come on. Then Sam. Where does he live? Marsden Hotel. Under his own name? No, I... I, I don't... I don't blame you. I could use a few moments of unconsciousness myself. The Marsden Hotel didn't have a Dutch name on the register. So I got a hold of the housekeeper and found out how many rooms her staff hadn't been able to make up all day because of no disturbed signs on their doors. And then I went a-calling at those particular rooms. On the ninth floor, I wakened one old maid. On the seventh, I startled a bunch of poker players who thought they were being raided. And on the fourth, I struck the door of 427 and the jackpot. Who's there? Don't you see the sign? I do not wish to be disturbed. Sorry, I must have the wrong room. I started up the hall after the fire axe. When I got to it, I changed my mind. Out of the few things I learned about this guy, Van Sand, was that he loved to shoot people through doors. So I decided against trying to chop his down. Then I remembered the way those people came pouring out of those offices earlier in the day when they heard that fire alarm. So I picked up the little red hammer next to the big red fire axe, broke the little glass window, pulled the little brass hook, and set off a big brassy noise. And then I rushed back to 427. Fire! Fire! Red fire! Fire! There! There, Sophia! Right here in my eyes, sweetheart! Why you come here, you wish you don't? Never mind, addresser. You're through shooting guns. What do you think, Van Stan? You want to try some more? You cannot make me stay here. So fire, we will all die. You'll look good barbecued, but I'll make a deal with you. You talk, and if I like what I hear, I'll show you how to get out of here alive. How I know this? You don't think I'm going to stay here and fry, do you? And if you don't start flapping that tongue in a hurry, I'll probably just tie you to a chair and run. So first, where is the real Van Bruton? You will find him in the bedroom. Yeah, he'd better be alive. He's out cold. What's the matter with him? He will be all right. He's under sedatives. Where did this identity switch start? Come on, hurry up, talk. I smell smoke. I knew Van Bruton from Antwerp. I know about the sale of his interests. I know the girl in the office here had never seen Van Bruton. Look, we go now. Don't get up. Come on, keep talking. I can feel it getting warm in here. Oh, it's a firefighters. We will be safe. Don't be too sure. They always start at the top floor and work their way down. Come on, I can hear those flames crackling. You know the rest. 
Last night, when the transaction was all finished with Perry, I, I gave to Van Bruten some sedative in his cocoa. So you set up that bomb so Perry would get it before you showed up to pick up the check, huh? Yeah, I told you that. How the girl knows I am an imposter, I don't know. Well, let me tell you. She's been sending old Van Bruten toupees for the last four years. Gray ones, my red-headed friend. Oh, uh, I can stand up now. We go out from here, no? We go out from here, no? Yes, out. Cool. <laughs> Expense account, item four, a dollar forty. Night letter informing you that American Continental would have to meet payment of claim to Mrs. Christine Perry, innocent widow of the insured. The only thing she was guilty of was trying to stay on the right side of a hot-tempered boyfriend. She lied about who she was with at the Clover Club not to fix herself an alibi, but to keep Al Donovan from learning that she'd been out with another man. That man being the real Mr. Van Bruten, who had only taken her out to try to talk her into reconciling with his friend, her husband. Expense account item five, $100. Fine for turning in a false alarm which, since you're paying it with me, is just fine. Expense account total, $463. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Featured in our cast were Walter Burke, Gene Bates, Joe Duvall, Ted DeCorsia, Joyce McCluskey, and Raymond Burr. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Beginning next week, we are moving to a new time and day, and we hope you'll join us on Tuesday evenings when Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. You who, Mrs. Bloom, Molly Goldberg's famous invitation to fun in the Bronx now echoes across the country each Saturday night on CBS. It's the same fine brand of comedy mixed with a tear now and then that's made Molly and her whole family, Jake, Sammy, Rosalie, and the others, favorites for many years. CBS invites you to hear the Goldbergs on most of these same CBS stations this Saturday and every Saturday. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Disaster is no respecter of persons, and it can strike any time, but your Red Cross never sleeps. It has to be ready constantly in case of an emergency. This is your protection. Keep it strong. Now is the time to support Red Cross for your sake. Remember, for every dollar you gave before, this year add a quarter more. If you gave Red Cross $10 last year, this year give it $12 and a half. Give gladly. Join Red Cross. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure next Tuesday night at the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>